We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So blessed you could be here this morning. And uh, we also want to welcome those who will watch this later online and just ask the Lord to continue to move amongst His church and the body of Christ. And we're just so blessed to be His children. Amen? Amen. God is really good. He is so awesome. Well, let's go ahead and uh, before we start, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll go ahead and just jump in with prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We ask you, Lord, to open your word to our hearts, Father, that we would hide your word within our hearts, that we would not sin against you, as the psalmist said, Father, as we, as we lead this place, as we live our lives before you. And we're going to learn today, Father, that your word comes to life in our life through our godly example, Father, as you work out godliness in each of our lives. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you for your word. We ask you now to join us and be with us. In Jesus' name, and all of his children said, Amen. Amen. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Now the Spirit expressly says, In latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. How many people here love the Word of God? I know I do. Every hand, okay. Uh, and knowing that is truth, we know we love to study His Word of God, but it's, it's His Word that leads us and guides us. It tells us it's the instruction that we need for God living, right? Amen? Would you guys agree with that? But Paul state, starts this chapter with a word about the Holy Spirit. He says the Spirit now expressly states, says that in the latter times, the last days, uh, and whenever the Spirit of God is speaking, we need to do what? We need to listen. We need to hear. Uh, the Shema is, a Jew, is the Hebrew word for hear. But it has a deeper meaning beyond just hearing. It has the inclusion of hearing and obeying. So hearing and obeying. So I bring that up because it's kind of interesting that God rewards what? He rewards obedience. But we're obedient, why and how? We're obedient when we hear God's word, when we listen to God's word, when we're led of God's word, as we're led by the Holy Spirit in life. God wants to bless us, and he wants us to, to look and see after him. Okay, the book of Revelation says seven times in the letters to, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he says seven times, this, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. But what the Spirit of God is saying here is that in the last days, the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Now, see, that departing is not like the apostasia, okay, the falling away that we read about in 2 Thessalonians when we did that study. But this is a voluntary departure. They're choosing to leave. They're choosing to leave. That, 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 that apostasy that's spoken of in 2 Thessalonians is a rebellion against the truth. It's a rebellion and then moving away, okay? They're openly defiant, but these ones right here are just voluntarily they're walking away from the truth. They're neglecting the truth. And because of that, if they walk away from the truth, then it, that obviously shows what? That they're not saved. They're not being led of the Spirit of God. And so when you're not being led of the Spirit of God, guess what happens? Well, <clears throat> you start giving heed to the deceiving spirits. Because there's two spirit. There's, there's two senses of spirit at work in this world. God's Holy Spirit, okay, which is omnipresent, which is everywhere, and there's darkness, there's the evil one, there's, there's Satan and his minions. Those two things are at work, okay? As a matter of fact, it's not in your notes, but the Lord just laid it in my heart. <clears throat> he says in Ephesians, let's turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6 real quick. <clears throat> just starting out and I'm already diverting. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he's speaking of putting on the armor of God. But he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemings of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spirit, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, you know, we, we tend to, I mean, in the world, as we live day to day, there's moments, there's times when we, we feel like our battle is with our, with our neighbors or with our brothers and sisters. But really, that battle is taking place on a spiritual level. It's being lived out through the lives of those. So you're either led by the Spirit of God or you're led by the Spirit of darkness, okay? So he says, giving heed to deceiving spirits. They're listening to the wrong spirit, okay? But it says... I just want to remind you of something. Remember the garden, what happened in the garden? Eve was deceived. Why? Remember the the devil came and Lucifer came, the serpent came and tempted her, deceived her? What did he do immediately? He cast down the word of God. Okay? Has God indeed said? He's casting, putting doubt in her mind, right? Or he says, you will not die. Okay, you won't die, Eve, if you eat of it. See, it began all the way back in the garden. It began back in the garden. Jesus speaking to the religious leaders in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. It says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar, and it says the father of it. Okay? So Satan is a liar. He's a murderer. What did he do? Well, he deceived Eve, right? God said the day that you eat of this fruit, you will surely what? Die. So there was a death that took place in the garden. Adam and Eve spiritually became dead. They spiritually became dead. But there truly was a death that day in the garden. Remember that God took away the fig leaves? And what did he clothe clothe them with? Animal. An animal. An innocent animal had to die, which is a beautiful picture of what God was going to be doing thousands of years later on Mount Moriah in, in Jerusalem when Jesus on Calvary, when Jesus went, the Lamb of God, and he died. And he was the thing. But he also goes, Paul goes on to state, in doctrines of demons, just as Satan did to Eve, his minions are twisting scripture to this day. They're leading people out. They're leading people astray. Okay? Verse, Paul continues in verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Jesus was constantly calling out the hypocrites, the religious leaders. Okay? <clears throat> Jesus was constantly calling him out. Matthew chapter 7, verse 4, he says, How can you say to your brother, let me remove this speck from your eye, and look, there's a plank in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So the religious leaders were always pointing out things. Oh, let me, let me get this speck out of your eye for you. Okay. But Jesus was basically saying, you guys got a two-by-four sticking out of your eye, and you're wanting to get close enough to me to remove the speck out of mine? You see the contrast? So God's saying, you guys got bigger problems, and you're worrying about my problems? Worry about what you, you need to shore up your work. You need to do the right things. You need to be following. You need, don't be a hypocrite. Okay? Look what Paul states, having their own conscience seared with the hot iron. So having their conscience seared. When God created a man, he created a man with a conscience. Okay? With a conscience. As Romans 2 puts it, look at, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Have I lost anybody yet? Are you guys with me so far? Okay. Romans chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 14. <clears throat> Romans 2, 14 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having a law, they are a law to themselves. Okay? 
You guys understand that. So these guys have not even heard the law. They haven't been instructed in godly living and righteous living. But yet they seem to appear there are some of them amongst them who are doing the right thing. Why? Because God wrote that law on their heart. And he uses a conscience to guide them. But let's keep going. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Okay, Their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts doing what? Accusing or else excusing. So your conscience accuses or excuses you. Okay? So God gave man a conscience. It's it, it in the heart of man to, to do right and to do wrong. He knows the difference between right and wrong. You hear a lot of people say, well, I didn't know there was a God. Yeah, you do. You can look at creation and see that there's a God. You can truly see the, the awesome hand of the God in work. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, did the eyeball just happen to be designed so wonderfully? There's stuff that we're still learning about the eye. There's stuff we're still learning about the human body. But we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of who? God. Absolutely, in the image of God. However, man's appetite for sin and his continuing surrender to sin go against his conscience to the point that he becomes calloused. Have you guys ever experienced callousing your conscience? Yeah, absolutely. Every single one of us have done it. Every single one of us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 says, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, there's that conscious thing, they don't even longer feel anymore, so they, they, they've seared their conscience, okay? Who have been past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. So what they're wanting to do is they're, they're feeding their what? Their flesh. They're feeding their flesh. That's all it's, all, that's all it's about, feeding their flesh. Their result of doing this thing, being past feeling, once you get going that past feeling, then your conscience has become seared with the hot iron, becoming insolent, okay? <clears throat> Paul continues his thought in verse 3, forbidding to marry. Oh, you'll be more holy if you can remain celibate and not do these things. You are so holy because you're doing that. You're looking, you're doing, you're doing this wonderful job. No, it's okay to get married. That was the design God had man and woman, man and woman, to get married, okay? To get married, to have a relationship. Because in the marriage, there's an opportunity to show the world the godly relationship that is in the, between the bride and Christ. Remember, you have Ephesians chapter 5, which states that. Because Jesus, remember, he was talking to the husbands, you ought to love your wives, Wise, you need to submit to your husband, that S word. Oh my gosh, that S word. But he says, just to, I'm not picking on the ladies here, because he says that S word before in chapter four, where he says you guys are to be submitting to each other together. Okay, we're to submit to one another in what? In love. Love. <clears throat> love is submit, love will, will bring submission about. <clears throat> but this is legalism through and through. Paul had this to say in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, you can look on your page, your scripture reference. It says, for the kingdom of God is not in what? In eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy. In who? The Holy Spirit. So these ones that are being led away by doctrines of demons, that are being led away by Satan and his minions, they don't have the Spirit of God in them, okay? But we have the Spirit of God living in us. And because we have the Spirit of God in us, what's the Spirit going to produce in our life? He's going to produce righteousness, holiness, godliness, okay? And we need to understand that it's not a works-oriented thing. It's not a legalistic thing. It's not legalism, okay? God does not accept us because we do good. He says there is no, not one good. Well, that pretty much includes all of us in this room. So we got to get past that stinking thinking, you understand, and realize that we're saved by faith. We're saved because of God's grace. We're saved because of God's mercy. 
God did not give us what we deserve. He gave us something we didn't deserve. You guys, you guys, you guys understand? <clears throat> Listen to the rest of verse 3. Which God created, speaking of the, uh, of the food and the, and, and, and the things that he made, he created for, the, for God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Who believe and know the truth. Those who depart from the faith have forgotten God's goodness and his provision. And where he says in the scripture, he says he causes the rain to fall from heaven on who? On who? Just the good? No, on everybody. But see, the man that is apart from God forgets that simple fact. And so with that, we need to be thankful for the provision that God is giving us. Okay? Don't forget that God, by his mercy, saved each and every single one of us. He sent his son into the world to die for us. Okay? Romans chapter 1 says it beautifully. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Were darkened. Wow. That sounds pretty similar to that thing that God talks about is going to happen when he removes his, 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 the influence of the church out of the world. What's going to happen? He's going to give them over to, to their own flesh, just like he says here in Romans. But what he's going to do is he's going to harden their heart. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not receive the love of the truth. God has provided everything as a part of creation. His provision to man. God knows that you have need of all the things that you have need of. Okay? God has, knows that. Jesus states in Luke chapter 12, verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. But what does he say? But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be what? Shall be added to you. That's what we can go through life. We don't have to worry about these things. We can say, Lord, you are faithful. It says in the Old Testament, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread. Okay? Truly righteous. If you're, after, if you're pursuing God in holiness and righteousness, you're pursuing the things of God first. You're putting God first. God is going to take care of you, of you. He's going to take care of your needs. Okay? Remember what he said about the sparrows? <laughs> the sparrows don't gather. They don't have barns. But God takes care of them. He says not one of them falls on the ground without him knowing about it. Our God is omniscient. He sees your need. He knows exactly what you have need of. And the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom, whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. God is always good. He's always provided for us in, in beautiful ways. <clears throat> and when it comes, we should be thankful. Look at verse 4, Timothy verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay? God spoke to Peter in a vision. Okay? In Acts chapter 10. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 11. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 11. Acts chapter 10, verse 11 says, And saw... From heaven opened and an object, Peter saw from heaven, opened and an object like a great sheet bound to four corners, descending to him and letting down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, not me. I'm not going to do it. Nope. For I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him a second time saying, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Okay? You must not call common. So we just read in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is what? If it is received with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So when you receive something from the Lord, what do you, you can be all happy that you got what you got, but really 
the thanksgiving and the, our attention needs to go back immediately upon the Father of lights who provided it for his provision, gave it to us, okay? It's okay to give thanks to God, all right? It's okay to do that. For there is nothing wrong with thanking God for his provision. Verse 5 says, For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Going to God in prayer puts our focus where? On him. Regardless of the situation. We got to keep our eyes on the prize, okay? Don't be distracted. And that's exactly what the enemy is going to do, okay? I could tell you there's times I'm in church, even times when I'm, when I'm teaching or I'm praying, and all of a sudden this thought phew, shoots through your head, and you're like, where did that come from? It's a flashbang. You know what a flashbang is? Police and, and military use it as a, as a grenade. It's like to distract. It's to draw your attention away from what you're doing. And the enemy is so good at doing that. He distracts us. I like how pastor was talking. He goes, yeah, you'd be studying for the word or you'd be reading your Bible. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden this little pop-up pops up on your iPad as you're reading your word. And it says, hey, there's a sale going on at JCPenney. Okay, let's, <laughs> you know. And, and immediately, you're like, oh, I'm going to click on it. And then what, what, when you click on it, what happens then? <laughs> Your mind is not on the word of God, and that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to distract. He wants to pull you away from the word of God. He wants to pull you away. He wants to distract you. <clears throat> Paul continues to encourage this young pastor in verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But he says in verse 7, But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise, your, exercise yourself. What does he say? Toward what? Godliness. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Continue in what you've been instructed to do. And he says, you will be a good minister. Do you remember what we studied last week? We, we, discovered, we, we, we studied on bishops and what? Deacons, remember? This word is diakonosis. Diakonos, which is minister. This word minister here. And it actually is the same word, deacons. Okay, which remember, remember what the definition of deacons was? It says in the dust. They're stirring up dust because they're busy doing things about the church. They're busy about doing that. But he's saying you'll be a good minister if you'll be, be in the dust, but you're teaching, you're leading, you're exhorting, you're studying your word, you're working towards godliness. See, everybody's ministry, believe it or not, every single person's ministry here starts at home first. It starts in your own personal responsibility to God between you and God in the Word. So you need to be getting some dust. You need to knock that dust off the old Bible and get in your Word to be faithful ministers because we're all ministers of the gospel. God's called us all to be instruments, vessels for His use, for His purpose. And that's what God wants to bring out of our lives. But He does it through spending time in His Word. Okay, continue teaching the people to follow after these doctrines and pleasing God and pursuing him in holiness, which is another definition of godliness. Are you pursuing after God? Are you pursuing after being holy? Are you looking after the things of God? Are you keeping your mind on the things of God? If you are, you're not going to have time for the stuff that, that distracts or the stuff in the world. So put on the mind which is Christ has, put in the same mind that Christ had. Putting God first, serving the Lord. Because if we look at Jesus Christ on every page of the Gospels, as we read about his life, what was Jesus always doing? Always pleasing the Father. That was his goal. I want to please the Father. I want to do the Father's will. Guess what? We're to mimic God. We're to imitate God, right? That's what the Word of God says. Imitate God is what? His dear children. So we need to pick up our cross, we need to deny ourselves, we need to die to ourselves, and we need to follow him. We need to follow after the Lord. And that's what he wants. That's what his dynamic of his spirit empowers us for that God of living, to, to, to do the things that God has called to do. He'll empower you, okay? He'll empower you. 
Uh, he repeats his instruction to Timothy about being good and, and following after and lead, leading a God in life. But he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, he says, but you must continue in the things which you have what? You have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Okay? As we read about young Timothy, Timothy has his grandma. Okay? Timothy had his mom. Timothy had Paul as a young man raised up, okay? So he had godly examples, people that lived according to sound doctrine, people that lived the, 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 the doctrine that God had uh, put forward, and they instructed Timothy in doing these things. So that's what he's saying. He goes, in 2 Timothy, he says, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Our assurance comes through God's faithfulness because we see God is already faithful and he, he who said it will what? Will do it. God's word will never come back void to him. Never. It will accomplish the thing that he sent it to do. It will accomplish the thing that he sent it to do. <clears throat> In the opening verses, Paul warned about the doctrine of demons. And here he is telling Timmy, to, Timothy to remain nourished in God's word. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. But again, he's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy, but he's telling him, not only are you supposed to do those things you've learned, but continue, look, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase in more ungodliness. Be diligent to present yourself. Uh, as the King James says, study to show yourself approved, okay? Stay in God's word, okay? The reason that we're putting God's word in us is so God can pull it out, but also because we can look and see, hey, you know what? That's just idle babbling. What you're saying is not God's word. It's not God's truth. So I'm going to turn my back on that, and I'm going to walk away from it, okay? Or you can say, hey, you realize that that thinking is not in line with what God's word said? God's word says this. So this is what we need to do. And so that's what the, he's saying to shun pervading idle babblings, for they will increase in what? More ungodliness, which is the, ap, the op, complete opposite of what God wants to produce in your life, which is godliness, if we walk after the spirit, Okay. God will keep us in his way. In Psalm 139, I love going to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Psalm 139, verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any way, any wicked way in me. God will show you. But it goes on to say, And lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus said, I am the way truth. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know what the early Christians called themselves? The way. It's kind of interesting. God will keep us in the way everlasting. God will keep you in his son, Jesus Christ. He's hidden you there. He's hidden you. You know, remember that treasure that Jesus saw, that Jesus spoke of the parable, of the man that found the treasure in the field? Well, guess what? God hides his treasure where? In his son. <laughs> and you and I are that treasure that he hid in his son. <clears throat> so when God looks at you and I, guess who he sees? He sees his son. He sees a perfection that is his son. Okay? He's not looking to you. He's not looking to you to be that you have to earn your salvation. You have to be perfect. He says, be perfect, for I am perfect. So when you realize that you can't attain to perfection and you stumble and you fall, what are you supposed to do? Confess with your mouth. Repent, do a 180 and walk away. You guys get that? But that's not just one time deal. Jesus said, he go, he was asking Peter, he goes, how many times if your brother sins against you, how many times did you forgive your brother? And Peter, feeling holy, seven times, Lord? He goes, I tell you not just seven times, but seven times 70. 
okay? So God is wanting a relationship with you. He's wanting to keep you in a place where you're constantly perfect and pure in him, but you have to go back to him every time you trip and fall and you stumble. That's why the word of God says a righteous man falls, but guess what? He gets back up. He stands. He follows. And the way that we do that is going back to God, going back and repeating that work. And that's what God is doing in each and every single one of our lives through the work of his Holy Spirit, okay? We need to listen and obey. Remember we talked about the Shema? To hear, okay, we need to not only hear, but we need to have a deeper, that deeper meaning of the Hebrew word Shema means to hear, but it also means to hear and obey, okay? But listen to Psalm 119. It says, how can a young man or a young woman cleanse his way? What does it say? By taking heed according to your word, by hearing, listening, obeying, by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your what? Your commandments, from your word. We need to stand, we need to stand fast. We need to run the race, as Paul says. <clears throat> Verse 6 ends, which you have carefully followed. Timothy was doing as he should. Yet Paul instructs him in the end at, in verse 7 states, but reject profane and old wives' tables, uh, fables. As a young pastor, he was responsible for continuing in the truth, for living out the truth, but he was also responsible to weed out those who were teaching doctrine contrary to the word of God to which he had already received. Okay? Proverbs 14, 12, it says that there was a way that seems right to a man, but its end is way of what? Death. We want to follow the way of life, everlasting. So we want to follow Jesus. He's our example. He's our prime example. Matthew 7, 14 says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Okay which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. This, this word, if you're really getting this, you really grasp this, there's a whole lot of people that say they're Christian. But is it true? There's going to be few who find it. So we need to give that much more diligence and attention to walking out, to living our life in such a way that we're pleasing to the Father, and as verse 7 ends, exercise yourself towards godliness. Exercise. Working out yourself. Okay? And he continues this thought in 1 Timothy 4.8. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of life that now is of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. So Paul's going on to say, hey, bodily Exercise profits a little. Sure, working out can make you be healthy and, you know, and, and, you know, the diets and stuff. I mean, some of us, I mean, I was, I, was, I was rather chunky and I'm starting to lose some weight. But I need to do that for my health sake. But my priority doesn't need to be my body. My priority needs to be my what? My spirit, my soul, under the Lord. Because this is all temporal. This body is corrupt. This body is corrupt. And we know it. Why? Because the body wants what the body wants, and the body does not want the things of God. It does not. It wants those things that are contrary. Okay? <clears throat> but godliness is profitable for all things. And that is what helps us to move forward. But remember, godliness is a byproduct of who? The Holy Spirit. As we submit our will to God's will, as we allow the Spirit of God to work in us, that's where true godliness comes from, okay? We can put on a facade and look holy, but God sees all things. There's nothing hidden from his sight. You can't fool God. You might be able to fool us, but you can't fool God. He knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart, it says. 
1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but no one, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Okay? Think of it this way. We're all running a race. Okay? And when we run a race, how many people in here are competitive? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay? We're all competitive. But Paul says, run the race so that it's you you're looking, you're looking out for you to obtain the prize, okay? To obtain the prize that you may obtain it. Peter states this. <clears throat> Remember I said everything is temporal? Well, 2 Peter 3.11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? All these things is temporal. It's all going to melt away in a fervent heat. In a moment, it's going to be burned up. It's going to be consumed. Our bodies are warm food, okay? Our bodies are warm food, okay? We go back to the humus. We go back to the ground where we came. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Living with an eternal perspective <clears throat> leads to a fulfilled life here on earth, okay, as well as beyond. So if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, guess where our reward is going to be? In heaven. God knows what you have need of here. He'll take care of it, okay? Verse 8 concludes, having promise of that life that now is and of that which is to come. Paul says this is good. This is a good saying, okay? The spiritual far outweighs the temporal, the physical, okay? Verse 9 says this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. <clears throat> Here is something that you can count on. That's what Paul is saying, okay? This is a good, acceptable statement. You can count on this. You can count on God fulfilling his promise. You can count on God fulfilling his word. Verse Timothy 4.10 says, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. We both labor and suffer reproach. Okay? Jesus on laboring in Luke chapter 13, he says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Okay? Jesus said in regard to suffering in John chapter 15, Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your word. Okay? So Jesus has already told us that narrow is the gate, right? And there's few who find it. Okay? He says here, he goes, if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Okay? Are we better than Jesus? No, we're not. But so many times, why, Lord, why am I going through this? Why am I having this trouble? Why am I in this tribulation? Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. The thing you have to look out for is if you say you're a Christian and there's no persecution coming your way, are you really impacting the world in a way to gather some persecution? That's, that's a thought. The foundation of our faith is, what's the foundation of our faith? Trusting in God. And that's what the end of verse 10 says, because we trust in the living God. So we're, we're oblivious. You know, you heard of Captain Oblivious being, you know, he's not aware of everything around him. Well, I don't care if the world is falling apart around me. I don't care if my life is falling apart around me. I need to continue following through. I need to continue pursuing Christ. Because in that trial, in that tribulation, God is doing what? He's producing righteousness in my life. He's producing holiness in my life. Peter talks about the testing of your faith being much more precious than gold when it's tried by fire will be found in the praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to continue to pursue him. Okay? 
everything we must do, we must do trusting in the living God. Okay, Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The pursuit of God, despite your obstacles, despite what's going on around you, continue through it. David is a prime example. Okay, David, he fought against a lion, right? He fought against a bear. Who else did David fight against? Giant. And who did he go against a giant with? With the living God. Living God. He picked up five, five smooth stones, but it wasn't because he knew he was going to miss. That giant had brothers. Okay? But God empowered David. He goes, you come to me with sword and shield, but I come to you in the power of the living God. Okay? That's the power and the authority that we need to walk forward in this life. We need to walk forward in this life in the power and the might of the Holy Spirit. As God's Spirit is empowering you to walk the godly life, the living, the powerful life, the, power, the Spirit-filled life. Okay, That's where the dynamic changes in your life. That's what is going to bring, well, people are going to look at this and say, you're going you're, you're to walk in the room and go, oh, shh, they're, they're here. We can't talk about that stuff anymore. You ever have people do that to you? You show up at work and they're in there gossiping and talking about something. All of a sudden the subject changes when you walk in the room. Praise the Lord! <laughs> Praise the Lord. The end of verse 10, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He died for all the world, but not all the world is going to believe in him, right? But to those who believe... He is our salvation. He's a savior of all men. <clears throat> He's a savior of all men. Put your trust in him, verse 11 says. 1 Timothy 4, 11 says, These things command and teach. Preach the word, Timothy. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 2, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. When we share God's word, people may seem offended. They may even get angry. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, they try to change the subject and they start cursing you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Their problem really is not with you. Who's their problem with? It's with God. It's with God's word. Okay? It is not your problem. It's their problem with God. And God will deal with that person. Okay? Matthew chapter 10 he says, and whoever will not receive you or hear your words when you depart from that house or that city, shake off the dust from your feet. Shake off the dust from your feet. Verse 12, 1 Timothy 4, 12, let no one despise your youth, Timothy. He doesn't say Timothy there, I put that in. But let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Six things. This right here is a whole another study into itself. But I won't do that to you guys. <clears throat> Let no one despise your youth. You might be young, Timothy, but your strength and confidence are in the Lord. Okay? There are other ways that you can teach people. How? He says, through your example, through the way that you live your life. Okay? Be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. Let God use your testimony. But how does your testimony look? Is it full of holes? Is it dirty? Or is it washed, pure, in the washing of the water of the word that you've cleansed yourself with daily? As God talks about cleansing his wife, God wants us to wash ourselves with his word so he can present us as a bride, beautiful and clean, okay? Verse 13, he says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So study, support yourself, and encourage yourself, continuing teaching sound doctrine. Continue teaching, that's other people. But it's a beautiful thing here. 
He says in verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the eldership. Okay, continue to use the abilities and gifts that are in you, Timothy. Okay, perhaps Paul saw something in young Timothy as a young man and he, 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 he gave, he, he, prophesied over him, right? Well, eventually, as Timothy's raised up and he's living up, he's fulfilling the ministry that Paul already saw being in him. He brought Timothy before the elders and the bishop, the bishops that came, the elders came and laid hands on him. He said, being by the laying on of hands, okay? So that's the order of things. When we are watching young people grow up around us as we're raising people up, as we're raising leaders in the church, church up, as we may see something in them, and you may uh, articulate that to them, and then you start seeing that person working out, walking in those gifts, then guess what? They're growing, they're maturing into it. The Lord is doing the work. You know, it's not us discipling these guys. It's the Lord doing the work. So God will bring this person up. And once he do it, all it's our job to do is just recognize the calling on a person's life. God uses pastors and teachers. He uses you to be a teacher. <laughs> okay. Do you realize? <clears throat> you realize that God I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I'll come back to this thought. But remember the parable of the talents Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 25? Matthew 25, 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants, all the servants, and delivered his goods to him. He gave them each things, right? <clears throat> his own goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. So God identifies in each person what you're capable of handling, what you're capable of doing, and he gives, he entrusts these things to us. But guess what? God expects us to do with those things. Not just in our laurels. You understand? He expects us to invest. All right? Jesus is returning soon, Okay. Are you using your gifts and your talents for the furtherance of the gospel, for the furtherance of the kingdom? Okay. <clears throat> Verse 15 says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Meditate. That meditate means to ponder, to, to think on, to, to spend time thinking about it. It's like, and I'm not I'm trying, but sheep, sheep, they can chew a little bit of cud, but Cattle chew cud, okay? You sit there and you ponder and you go, hmm. There's a scripture that said meditate on your word, right? Well, there's a scripture in Psalm 119, 15, not the one you're thinking, but Psalm 119, 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. There's that pondering. There's that thinking. There's that contemplation that takes place, thinking about God's word. I will delight myself in your statutes, I will not forget your word. I will not forget your word. Verse 16 goes on. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. Listen, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Remember I said a minute ago that you guys are all teachers? We are all teachers. Okay? We're walking in, in fellowship with one another. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. We're sharing those things. That it just means to share in common. What you have in common with that person, you're sharing in common. Have you heard the adage, iron sharpens iron? Okay, so as we're teaching, we can hear things, we can learn things, and we're sharing this. Hey, do you know that this means, do you need this little nugget the Lord gave me? This little, little tidbit? And you're like, wow, that is so cool. You know, and then you remember it. And then you go and share that nugget, Okay. Well, it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 21, the first half of it, says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Let's ex let me expand, expand on that just for a minute here, and then I'll be closing up here in just a second. Okay? He says at the end of verse 16, You will save both yourself and those who hear you. 
Timothy is supposed to be, he's talking to Timothy, so he's telling him to teach, exhort, right? But he also tells himself to encourage himself by studying, by reading, by knowledge, right? He says, you will save both yourself and those who hear you, okay? Remember, therefore, you who teach another, you also teach yourself. Because as you're studying the word of God, even as, as I study for, these, for, for the messages, as Pastor Steve studies for message, for the messages that we're giving, we're studying, we're in, in the word of God, right? God's putting scriptures into us. He's filling us up with the scripture. Why? So he can draw it out of us. So he can share. And so we end up growing and maturing in the word of God. And it's like, wow, Lord, this is so awesome to see what you're doing. But you realize that through helping save you, I'm also yes. saving myself. Not in the sense of salvation, but living right, right living, godliness, okay? And so that's the way, that's the attitude. We need to have this attitude that Paul is talking to Timothy about. We need to depart from the doctrines of demons. We need to depart from those things which are not pleasing to the Lord. We need to depart from wickedness, from evilness. We, need, we don't want to get bound up and get lost in legalism. Oh, you, you eat that? You shouldn't eat that. No. Everything is good. Everything is good. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you for your word, Father. We thank you, Father, that you have brought your sheep to the pasture, Lord, to, to graze in your fields, Father. And we just thank you for your word, Father. Just help us to meditate on these truths, Lord, that we would bring forth glory to your life, Lord, as we live out your word daily in our lives. Father, I thank you for the fellowship, Lord, that we share here on Friday mornings. Lord, it is such a blessing. Father, we thank you and we ask you to continue to be with us, Lord. We're looking forward to the time, Lord, that you return. And we just bless you and praise you for all that you're doing in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this, this building, this church, this, this, this physical church building, Lord, because it's your church, the people that are in it, that are the body of Christ. Father, we just thank you for Calvary Chapel Cypress, Lord. And we just ask that your blessing continue to be upon it. We pray for our pastors and our teachers. We pray for everybody that's in ministry here, Lord, that you would bring uh, the fields are white, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you would bring more laborers. We pray that you would just be faithful. Lord, we know that you are the God who truly hears. You're the God who truly sees. And Father, we just ask that you would pierce our ears with your word. Father, that we'd, we would hear, that it would enter our hearts and our minds, and, and Lord, that it would bring forth nourishment to our bodies, as Paul said. Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless you for all things in Jesus' mighty name. And all together, as children say, amen. amen.